Um, uh, Jim is my colleague in the Department of Viticulture and Enology, a cooperative extension specialist who has had a special interest in Zinfandel and has been part of what is a very exciting heritage project, which he's going to talk to us about today. Jim? Thanks very much, uh, Deborah. Um, before I start, um, I did want to make a give a give a public uh, thanks uh, to uh, to Scott McLeod and and, uh, and Rubicon. Uh, we uh, got their participation at our meeting called Rave, which is in uh, March. It was on this year on uh, phenolics and phenolic management and measurement and management. And uh, Rubicon presented there one of their uh, winemaking staff um, and uh, presented some wines and later on we hit Scott up to do a tour for some uh, Hungarians uh, and now we now he's back again so I hope we're not uh, leaning on uh, that winery too hard but just want to say thanks uh, to them um, it, this project is is a lot of fun um, it's nice to to, to uh, feel like you can you can have fun and work at the same time and um, my colleague Mike Anderson, uh, who's uh, is he here? He was here a second ago. He's sitting in the back. Um, uh, was is participating with me on this as a research associate. Um, the genesis of this was a trip that I took uh, to. Well, there's two. There's two points of the genesis of this. Um, one one was that I took a trip to Italy and uh, was hosted by some uh, researchers um, who were working. In, in 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 Tuscany, but in three separate areas in Montalcino, Montepulciano, and of course in Chianti, and they were going around finding old Sangiovese blocks or new Sangiovese blocks. They they weren't so concentrating on old; they were concentrating on good, um, and making selections individually. They were they were sort of isolated pockets of that, and and I was fascinated by it. I hadn't seen that in action before, and they said, "Well, we don't understand why you don't do that with Zinfandel," and and it kind of struck a, a chord with me. We had played around a little bit. The other genesis of this was we had played around a little bit with it, um, which is about the, as, as kind as I can be to, to our effort was really sporadic um, as a result of some complaints from winemakers, which I'll, I'll uh, mention in a, in a minute. But um, so, we, so we started this project, uh, and uh, it wouldn't be happening uh, without the support of, of ZAP. I'll mention them at the end, but I also feel like I need to mention them at the beginning. We did get some funding from the American Vineyard Foundation to get this started. But Zapp said they really wanted to do this. They were a 501c3. They wanted to show that they were involved in education. And they've been partners with us right along uh, the line with this. And probably no more support uh, one could ask for than, than, than they've gotten. And I think we're probably up over a couple hundred thousand dollars total aggregate support at this point. Or if not, we're, we're bumping up close against it. Uh, I'll give you my bias on this. Again, Carol could tell you more about this from a DNA perspective. But, uh, but the question was asked earlier about clonal variation. Uh, the amount of variation, uh, I think, is certainly dependent on the rate of favorable mutations. And of course, mutations are not always favorable. Sometimes they're they're uh, dramatically uh, bad for the vine. Vines and sometimes vines can probably even die as a result of it. Um, so, how often those happen? How f how frequently those happen is, is of course, uh, part of it. But of course, the length of time that a variety has been cultivated and uh, the, during the, the the Q and A, the, the the standard example is always uh, Pinot Noir. And now that Carol has revealed that Cabernet is a cross of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, although we don't know when that occurred, it is a relatively uh, recent phenomenon. I mean, maybe it happened in 1000 when, they, when their people were uh, AD when they were growing Pinot Noir, but, but more, more likely maybe not. So, so that may explain why the Cabernet is not as uh, uh, heavily mutated as, uh, uh, as Pinot Noir. Um, so that, that may explain it, is that it's not been cultivated long enough. Um, but also is how much effort you spend looking for that variability. And that may be another reason why Pinot Noir may be different than Cabernet. I don't know this for a fact, but my sense is, and some of you might know this from your travels through Europe, is that the vineyards in, in Burgundy are sometimes very small. And the, you know, the, and the standard joke is the grower knows the name of every vine uh, in his or her vineyard. And so it may be that they spot the mutations because they're looking at the vines more carefully than people with larger estates. So that's, that's another possibility. So, so when what obviously what we had not done for Zinfandel was spend any uh, uh, significant effort uh, to do this, and all you have to do is go back and look at that list uh, that the selections came from from Lodi and Livermore, and nothing from the North Coast was represented on, on that original list, and so uh, that's certainly uh, not a um, what you would call a a, uh, 
Uh, and you saw this before in, in, in uh, Deborah's slides. So this is not what you would call a thorough look. Um, so what we said was let's try to do a thorough look. Well, back to this complaint. Uh, and, I, and when I started, I started this job in 1985, and it wasn't long after uh, that I got the job that I got one of these telephone calls where you just hold the receiver out about right here, and you can hear perfectly fine from someone saying, you know, why don't you guys, uh, you know, really do some do some work on Zinfandel? Um, because the found that the clusters of our selections, um, who knows whether it was a result of, of uh, the cleanup of viruses or whether it was just something that people selected for, uh, the clusters are large, tight, and rot prone. Uh, the berries are large, and the wines tend to have poor color and varietal character. So there's strike one, there's strike two, there's strike three. You're pretty much out. Um, the conclusion was that these are good for white Zinfandel. In fact, great for white Zinfandel. Um, and the fact is that that they, because they're tight and rot prone, if you try to take some of these vineyards onto a red program, which is you want a higher uh, sugar content, of course, that's when the rot will set in. So a lot of the sour rots that happen happen later. Uh, oftentimes later in the ripening process. So that's another reason why they're good for white is you get them off before that happens. <clears throat> so how do we improve Zinfandel? Well, you, you know the story, but I'll, I'll repeat parts of it just for emphasis. You could return to the place of origin for diversity. And you know this, if, where do you go for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir? You go to Burgundy, where do you go for Cab Merlot and Cab Franc? You would go to Bordeaux. Where would you go for Sangiovese? You'd go to Chianti. Where do you go for Zinfandel? We didn't know. We had some idea, of course, that uh, the variety was grown. By that time, we'd, we'd had the Goheen story. We knew that it was in Bari. We had heard sort of anecdotally from the Italians. They said, it's not our variety. Maybe it came across the Adriatic. We don't know. We kind of dropped that, uh, that thought uh, in, 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 in favor of, of looking locally. But one of the other things you could say is, well, I'm going to go to another country where there is a history of use of that variety. And, and I put Argentina down here because I was thinking of Malbec. You could go to Bordeaux for Malbec, but they certainly have some very interesting tasting Malbecs out of, out of Argentina. So that's another thing. So where would you go for Zinfandel? Okay, now you could say we could go to, we could go to Bari for Primitivo, but they've already said that it wasn't a variety that, that was there very long in Italy, so what's the chance that you're going to find a lot of diversity? Again, we didn't say, well, that's not very high. So what the people, my, my, my friends and colleagues in, uh, in, in Chianti and, uh, were saying was, you've got all these old Zinfandel vineyards, why don't you check them out and see? Maybe you'll be surprised at, at the amount of diversity there is. And so if you go back to, to, to Charles' uh, uh, incredible, uh, incredibly rich uh, historical look that he gave us, one of the things we didn't know when we started out was how much genetic very diversity are we going to find? There'd be a couple of concerns about that. One is that it was really a single importation somewhere on the East Coast. Uh, that ends up in California as a, as a relatively narrow range of genetic diversity that has been planted around. Uh, and it also, maybe it doesn't mutate very uh, rapidly. And that we're going to do all this work and at the end of the day, they're not a dime's worth of difference amongst all of them. That was, that was where we were headed. We said, all right, let's, let's prove to ourselves whether there's, uh, in these local plannings, whether there's any diversity or not. So off, off we went. We call these our Zinfandel safaris. This is what Rhonda Smith from our, our farm advisor in Sonoma County called them. Um, and we had a number of people involved. In fact, the, the, the list has gotten uh, longer than this, and I, I should have updated the slide. Um, but my predecessor, Amon Casamatis, uh, we wanted his eye involved. Uh, he's still active, uh, was at that point. We started in the, in the mid-90s with, with some, some serious um, uh, effort at this. Rhonda Smith in Sonoma County Farm Advisor, Ed Weber, Napa County Farm Advisor, Janet Capriel in uh, uh, Contra Costa and Alameda. Paul Vertigal, who's here with us today, uh, did the, uh, the looking through Lodi, and it was, a, it was an eye-opening experience to, to, to work with Paul to go through Lodi because uh, there's a lot more 100-year-old vineyards there than I ever imagined that there were. Jack Foote, who was our farm advisor at the time uh, in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties, Donna Hirschfeld. Uh, first it was uh, Del Farnham uh, in Amador, and then Donna took Del's place. Uh, and, uh, and, she, and she's, by the way, will be, if she's not here yet, will be here this afternoon uh, and has done, done a lot more work. Both Paul and Donna have selected a lot more local selections than we were able to put in our collection because ours is uh, so, so widely divergent. And then Glenn McGordy in Mendocino County. 
Um, and, a, and a few of these things, I mean, you, you, you drive up and down the highways often enough and you, and you think you see a, a lot of things until you get somebody, uh, and I want to mention Dave Gates uh, as well, who will speak today, uh, as very, very helpful uh, in this because of all of his work with Ridge. And again, I'm, I'm going to remember names as we go along of people who I who I've ought to have acknowledged and, and, uh, and haven't, haven't put down on this slide. Um, but people who have been buying vineyards uh, or, or have bumped into them in one way or another or we read down through the wine spectator or wine enthusiast or someplace that says this is a single vineyard, a great piece of property, uh, some of those things caught our attention. And so we, uh, we used the local knowledge of the farm advisors who had been on farm calls for a long time and, uh, and we brought uh, them all together uh, in, into a collection. Uh, criteria with maybe I should say a small C because they weren't hard and fast criteria for inclusion in the heritage vineyard was that the vineyard age was needed to be more than about 60. Oftentimes we had a story that someone said well there was a 50 year old vineyard here and 30 years ago we took cutting so you would trace that back maybe 80 years. Um, but the, but, the, but the, the story that came along with this was that the vineyard uh, was, was, was quite old. Um, that that uh, that raises a question about is is that does that vine look that way because it's old or because it's genetically uh, different? And of course, there's there are several reasons why things can look different from site to site. It can be the site, it can be the genotype, it can be the way the, the grower is growing that particular uh, selection. So there there are things that you you have to do to 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 to, to ferret those out. And one of them is you take all of these selections to a single site then you've eliminated climate and soil, then you've eliminated the farming practice since both of those are now standard and what you left with is, is, is the genotype. So that was, that was going to be our goal. And as we selected these, the reason that I use 60 is that we started to see a pattern and, and uh, the pattern was that if a vineyard was planted roughly before uh, World War II, that it was uh, to the eye free of, of uh, red leaf, of symptoms of, uh, of leaf roll virus. And when you got into the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s for planting dates, it seemed to be that a lot of those almost uniformly were, were red and that's a result of dirty sign material, dirty rootstocks that were non-symptomatic and all the stories that you've heard about uh, why all of a sudden in the 50s and 60s we start talking about forming foundation plant services. Uh, that, that was the genesis of that, was this more uh, in, incredible you know, in, increase in the amount of, of leaf roll or, or uh, corky bark. Um, clearly, based on the comments from winemakers, we wanted looser clusters and smaller berries. Looser clusters because we know now, now there's more data, there was just observations before, looser clusters mean less rot. The berries don't touch as much or tightly. Uh, when the berries touch, we know the wax doesn't form well between the places where the berries touch. It's a great uh, point for um, infection, vibotritis or other uh, sour rot organisms. So if you try to loosen the clusters up, and this is true for every, virtually every variety, there's great slides that you could include on Pinot Noir uh, for that exact uh, case. Um, and, and then small berries because we wanted to try to increase the amount of uh, surface uh, skin to, to, to juice ratio. and then no red leaf in the fall. And so we walked these vineyards once just before harvest, as close as we could get to harvest. And then after we had flagged the vines and thought we had some stuff that looked pretty good, we went back and walked it again to be sure that any red leaf symptoms that would appear later on um, would be maybe more evident at that point and we might adios something that we thought otherwise we, we, might, we might include. Uh, I had a, a bet, I don't know if I ever paid uh, Deborah, but we had a, I had a bet that we would do a pretty good job. We had CAS, we had farm advisors, you know, I was along for the ride, um, that we would eliminate virus by this method and it was 50% roughly. We had 50% of them still, infect, still infected with virus after we did our red leaf check. So I think I owed Deborah a lunch or a dinner or something that I never paid up on, but I, I will. Um, and then often we made more than one selection from the same vineyard. We, we didn't know how many selections we were going to get uh, when we started, so we were a little aggressive about that. Um, and, and some of the original ones, and Fred Peterson's here, we, we, were, we were, you know, going around sometimes selecting uh, three or four uh, from a single vineyard. And uh, that later stopped because we started having more people approach us as we talked about this project. More and more people came forward and said, 
one of the vineyards you haven't thought of, especially when we got in, involved with Zap, uh, that uh, this this became you know really a, a, a cascade of of ideas about where to go. Um, but we did occasionally do that because we weren't sure that if you went to a particular vineyard that made excellent wine and was old and had all those characteristics and you make one selection, the question is, did you get the right one? I mean, is this a, is it more, is there more variability than that out there? And you just didn't plumb the depths of that variability very much. We said, okay, let's go back and, and, and try to take more, or as we go out there, let's take more than one. Well, we stopped that pretty quickly and you might see why. So the other additional criteria, <clears throat> uh, was genetic diversity. So we asked ourselves this question. We were in Sonoma Valley, of course, and we were at Dry Creek, and we were in Alexander Valley, and we were all over the place in Howe Mountain. And the question was, am I more likely to take two vineyards in Sonoma Valley, let's use them as an example, when they're adjacent to each other, or would you rather say, I'd rather go to the top of Howe Mountain and get one, um, or I'd rather go to another county, I'd rather go to El Dorado or Amador or somewhere. So we said, look, genetic diversity, if we're gonna, if we're gonna find this, if something has kind of, in the, in the way that the Italians were concerned that, at, or, or, or felt that as you look at Montalcino and they do their own internal selection for long enough, they sort of migrate uh, with, to sort of their own style. If that's true, uh, that local cuttings breed sort of local tendencies for certain kinds of, of material, the, the farmer says to the, his neighbor, the, you know, that looks like great Zinfandel, why don't you give me some of that? And then it becomes kind of a local selection in a way that what we'd be better off to do is go for geographic diversity. So that's what we did. We tried to get as many counties, just like the people who have the RVs and they color in the state that they've been to on the back of their RV so you can tell every place they've been. We were trying to do that with, with California counties. And, and the purpose was that not, not just for joking around, but for feeling that geographic diversity might give us the best shot uh, at clonal diversity. And we also included some because we just like the story. I mean, some of these stories are fascinating. Um, uh, Louis Pagani, before he passed away, was, I don't know, he was 90 some years, six, 96 years old when we talked to him, and he remembered the earthquake in San Francisco and when he was six years old. And I mean, it was just, just fabulous stuff. Um, and so, you know, you ask one, we asked one grower, just, what's your story with his infidel? And he starts with General Vallejo. I mean, it's just you know, incredible. Uh, and, and so it wasn't his story, it was the story that inherited with the property, obviously. But uh, so, so some we just couldn't, couldn't help ourselves. Um, so um, here's our map colored in. Um, the only place that I've heard of, of Zinfandel, old, an old planting outside of the state of California, was some reference to um, a place in Oregon, which would put it way up in the top here somewhere, but. Uh, near the Columbia River out on the east side of Oregon. And, I, and we never really pursued that. We just seemed like we had our hands full doing the California routine, and we didn't really know that we needed to do anything more than that. But it would be kind of interesting to test whether that was really true or not, and maybe you could find, a, find whether Charles has heard any reference to that. So, so we did uh, some, Sonoma was probably the most heavily represented uh, county. There's just an old vineyard around every corner. Um, and, and Napa had more than I thought it did, and, and we got to know a lot of those. Some of those now, are, you know, or are, are, are then even, were making it onto wine labels as vineyard designations, which made our job somewhat easier. And, and then, uh, then started this cascade. Um, Mendocino County, of course, things, many of them made famous by Jed Steele and, uh, and, and others up there, and, uh, and Amador, of course, uh, with, with Grand Père and, and things like that. Contra Costa, um, really uh, also thanks again to Klein um, and, and Janet. Uh, there are a lot of vineyards in Contra Costa, some of which are interplanted with Mervedra. Um, uh, I don't know if purposely or, or, or not. Um, and San Luis Obispo has, has quite a few, uh, especially in that area. Again, thanks to Dave Gates, uh, uh, Templeton area, we were able to locate a few. Um, again, I mentioned San Joaquin County, uh, Lodi as being a, a great source. Um, and, uh, and in Cucamonga, where really I shouldn't have called that a county, I mean, it's really, uh, we had one in uh, San Bernardino County and two from uh, Riverside. Um, also, we got some, one I think from Lake, one from Alameda, one from Calaveras, uh, I don't know how many from El Dorado, one or two, and then Santa Clara, again, thanks to, thanks to Dave. Um, and, and so this is our geographic diversity. And, and I should go back to mention that one of the, original justifications for this, which thankfully has gone away, that the justification was that in times around the mid 
80s to late 80s when the industry was was uh, maybe crabbing sideways would be the best way to put it, if not in a bit of a, of a downturn, that a lot of these old vineyards uh, ended up going for white Zinfandel. The one in Calaveras County, for example, is, is, is uh, uh, Ghirardelli. I mean, it, it's, it produces absolutely fabulous fruit, but the guy said he had to sell it for white Zin at the time because he just couldn't find anybody interested in making red wine out of it. Well, obviously that has really turned the corner now, and people are getting, I think, reasonably well compensated for very high quality fruit because they can get it out of the bottle price. Well, that wasn't the case back then. So we were partly, we felt, on a mission not just to learn more about Zinfandel, but to preserve some of these things. You talked about somebody getting a few hundred dollars a ton for white Zin on a vineyard that's producing a ton and a half of fruit, and that's not, that's not sustainable. If you want to, anyone wants to talk about sustainable viticulture, let's talk about economically sustainable viticulture. That isn't it. So we, uh, we really wanted to go around to some of these vineyards because we thought they were going to be lost. Um, and, a, and a tip of the hat, um, <coughs> now I've forgotten his name down there, Mike, can you help me? Um, the, the winemaker in Southern California that, that showed us those vineyards. Yeah, anyway, I'll think of his name in a minute. You, you know him, he's a, he's a winemaker. Ga, yeah, Don Galliano, bless his heart, he, he, he pointed us to a couple of vineyards down there. And of course, a lot of people up here in Northern California buy from down there or make wines from down there. But, but uh, I, I want to credit Don because he said when we visited one vineyard, he said if this was a building, they would slap a National Historical Monument sticker on this thing and you couldn't touch it. Uh, but it's a grape vineyard, and uh, there's not that same respect for it as there should be. And two of the three vineyards that we got cuttings from are now gone due to development. So I'm sure there are cuttings somewhere that survive them. But uh, So we, we had that kind of urgency at the time was that, geez, if, if, if we lose these, we could be in, in, uh, in, in trouble uh, for, for that, maybe lo losing that genetic diversity. And of course, you know, these are some, this is what some of the vineyards look like. Very, uh, you know, very well kept, uh, belying their age. Um, we were in other vineyards that don't look so good. We didn't get a lot of photos of those, but uh, one of the characteristics of some of these old vineyards was that, that uh, you could see through the trunk at some point uh, with the termites had finally gotten their way into them. And, uh, and that, that was one uh, evidence, piece of evidence that it was indeed as old as, as, the, as the people said. Um, but uh, just a lot of fun to, to go through and, and, uh, and find these stories. So now on to the data. There's always data. Um, we brought these to the Oakville Experimental Vineyard, which is the department's vineyard uh, in, uh, in Oakville. And the original group, um, we, we first started calling these phase one and two, and then, then this just became all part of phase one, one A and one B, if you will. We started with 63 selections, um, and then more people stepped forward and said that they wanted uh, to, to be included. And eventually it was, uh, I think, 14 counties, 50-some vineyards. Um, we, we did it as a, as a not quite a square planting, but it was uh, eight, uh, nine feet by eight feet, eight between the vines and nine between the rows. We used St. George rootstock for two reasons. Um, one, it's, it's the historical rootstock of Zinfandel. Um, and, and, and partly imp imparts to, to Zinfandel one of its characteristics, which is that it sets less berries per cluster typically than other rootstocks do. We've seen that many times uh, in most trials we see that. Um, and of course in Zin, where the clusters are tight already, a little bit of reduced set uh, is not only not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Um, but the other reason that we put it on St. George was because many of the vineyards we were collecting from, if they were still alive, they were probably on root stock. We did encounter a few vineyards that either the grower told us or we, we believe, excuse me, believe that they were uh, own rooted. But if you if you change root stocks um, and you uh, you know you know that you know the foundation plant services uh, story that uh, root stocks and viruses interact, so that if you change root stocks, sometimes a virus which is either not deadly or, or, or not even, you're not even aware of it on one rootstock, it might kill another rootstock. So we said, well, the best chance for us not to encounter uh, that type of uh, rootstock virus interaction is to put it back on the rootstock that it probably came off of, which was St. George. Head trained and spur pruned. This was an interesting discussion, um, which was pretty much a, a position that Zap held, I will say, with their feet in concrete that, that had to be head trained and spur pruned. And, and uh, we, uh, we, we uh, eventually uh, were worn down in this argument of wanting to put it on wire. Um, but it's, work, it's worked well. And part of it was uh, that, that we did want to do it in, in an old, old style. 
because uh, you're, you're either, I mean, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Whichever group you're talked to wants to know how it's going to perform the other way. And so we said, well, let's just start with head trains per prune. And when we get something that's good and we feel that's ready to be, to be released, we'll, we, can, we can put it out on a wire and see what happens. Uh, it's a gravelly bale clay loam. It's, a, it's a, not a real deep soil in this particular part of the vineyard, and that's another reason why we, we chose that particular section of the vineyard, was it was considerably shallower soil than some of the other places. And this is it. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a funny story on myself. Uh, our vineyard manager at the time, John Johnson, found these old split redwood stakes down the, the trail a piece uh, from our vineyard. And he put them in, and I, and I came to the vineyard, and I said, my God, Johnny, they're too short. They're down in the, they're only just this high. And every person that walked into that vineyard afterwards said they were perfect. So, so what do I know? Uh, I, thought they were, I thought they were headed too low. We had, a, we had a long discussion about, by the way, about how tall, and it was supposed to be knee high. And we said, well, who's knee? We were talking about how, how tall an Italian's knee is, and uh, we, we didn't get very far in that discussion. Um, so we did these, though, of course, in that, in that uh, fashion of uh, a, a goblet, if you will, with the shoots arranged, and, and they, it creates a nice canopy. These vines are, are, this is a pretty young picture of this vineyard, but, and you can see out here we have these cattle ear tags uh, that we use to separate uh, the vines. We use numbers, and I may have another slide on this uh, in, in a second, but we use numbers for two reasons. We didn't want anybody copping an attitude on us. So they walk through this vineyard, and if it says it's from area X, and I'm, no, no offense, because I know uh, um, Mark's here from, from Lodi Woodbridge, but I didn't want anybody telling me, oh, that's a Lodi selection. You know, I kind of wrinkle their nose up a little bit. Okay. So we said, okay, you tell me. If you think they're different, you tell me which one's which. And also, I wanted them to tell me which one was the UC one, which had the, which had the bad reputation. Um, and, and so we just said, let's do this completely uh, without uh, attribution to even the region, although we did start talking about county later on with some of these we did not uh, reveal where that was. And, and there's another reason for that that's more than just uh, potential for bias in who, what you think about particular areas and what kinds of zins they produce. The other one was is that Oakville is Oakville. It's not Dry Creek. Um, it's not Alexander Valley. It's not Sonoma. It's not, the, it's not Howell Mountain. So that selection may be doing very well. Thank you very much. Typically they were. That's why we selected them. It's on their, based on their reputation wherever they were. And if we bring them to Oakville, Maybe they wouldn't do the same there, and that might be a bias somehow if we reported that and attributed that name uh, that, that uh, you know, people felt that we might be hurt, hurting their reputation. So we said, well, let's just call it straight up as an as a, um, uh, anonymous treatment. I'm sorry, so that, that's it. So the donors, some donors requested anonymity. They did not want their name associated with it. There is that location. Uh, bias po possibly, uh, and that Oakville uh, is Oakville, and it's not other places. So, so now, the last 27 uh, did not uh, make it onto this slide. Uh, with, these are these are 63 selections. Um, we're missing, and, and there's a so a point for every. This really is one through 20. So it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's how you'd read that. Um, there's not 61 and there's not 63 because after we put it in, we found that they had family. We did a family check on everything so we wouldn't bring it onto the station. We missed those, but we got them later and, and, they're, and they're out. So this graph is a graph of yield in kilos per vine. Um, but I don't, I don't want you to concentrate so much on the absolute numbers, but look at the spread of, of two things. Number one, the spread of the various selections. And the square ones here were virus positive by uh, Foundation Deborah's test. Uh, I want to thank Sue Sim, who's here in the audience, and, and the whole crew over there at Foundation for doing a great job on this, and also the virus negative ones. Um, again, Sue, so that was about 50 percent. We were, we were, our eyes were, were not good enough to detect. Um, but the interesting thing about this, since this is 99, 2000, 2001, three-year average, this is the standard error uh, of the mean. And what that's telling you is when you have, uh, let's point out one like this one, you can't even see the error bars on that one, that the, the data are very consistent from year to year. On one which the, the line is very long indicates that it's wildly different from year to year. Uh, and so that's another, another component that we wanted to fit into this. But going back to my worry that we would be doing all this work um, and it would really not give us the kinds of differences that we were hoping to see, but clearly we're getting, we're getting some differences. 
Second point out of this particular slide is that with respect to yield, uh, which is of course a, com a component uh, made up of many uh, yield components, clusters per sh well, shoot, shoots per vine, clusters per shoot, uh, uh, cluster and cluster weight, which is made up of berries per cluster and berry weight. So all those things in aggregate lead you to, uh, to yield. Um, that uh, there clearly is a difference so that's, that's occurring from, from some one of those components. Uh, is, is uh, contributing to this yield difference. So did we see what we wanted? Yeah, we did. Uh, we saw some, some genetic, what, what we are interpreting right now to be genetic variability. Now the downside to this trial, which I, I didn't mention uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the slide that described the, the, the experiment, is that this particular trial, uh, because it was a library collection, was not replicated. We had seven vines of each of these 63. So what we had was one, a one-shot look at it. The question, of course, in everybody's mind, and especially in the, in, in the minds of scientists, is that's the reason we replicate things and we put the same clone in different spots in the vineyard because you really want to make sure that it's not just where it's planted that's causing it to react like this one right up here at the top or this one down here at the bottom. Uh, so we were, we were, a, li we're a little, we want to be a little cautious about saying that until we get the replicated trial, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, going that we want to be sure that we, we don't draw too many conclusions from this, some hard and fast conclusions because they're, they're not replicated. But, uh, but again, does it indicate to us that there's some variability? Yes, yeah, it's, it's what, it's twofold uh, from four to eight. So that's, 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 a, that's what we had hoped for. Cluster weight, um, again, we, we don't see that virus uh, infection does not seem to bias the red ones to be lower or higher. It seems to be that they're mixed um, in there. But the interesting thing about this is I'll reveal 41 is Primitivo um, and 43 is Primitivo. Um, always the lowest yield, always the earliest ripener. I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, I don't want to give away all, all the story here too, too quickly. But uh, so again, uh, yield differences were due to some degree to, to cluster differences. Again, uh, not exactly a twofold, but but getting but pushing that. And berry weights, we take berry weights to the to the nearest tenth, which is why they look to be somewhat stratified here. That's because they are. We round them to the tenth uh, of a of a gram. But again, uh, forty one is. Primitivo, um, clearly uh, different, but uh, what we don't see in this um, is we don't see the three UCDs, UCD 1A, 2, and 3, standing out, you know, way up. It's not that, I tell you, it's not number one, and it's not that one. Um, so, you know, it wasn't really clear to us that the kind of variability that we were seeing was due to the, due to the fact that we had these UC selections and then all these uh, industry selections that, that were out there. So let's look at some numbers now, not just the scatter. Um, so the data are either four years or, th or uh, I'm sorry, uh, eight, nine, so five years or four years uh, for some of the yield components. Um, if we look at everything, the average of all of those, those dots there was 4.8 kilos, but it ranged from 7.5 to 3.3 from highest to lowest. Um, we did a lot of standardization of uh, clusters per vine because we shoot thin to very similar uh, shoot numbers. Um, I mean, I'd have to go back to actually show you the shoots per vine as we've calculated it because it may be due to we, we had some breakage and some, some lost shoots here and there or blind buds or whatever it might be. But you can see that the standard, uh, standard deviation here is, is pretty, pretty small because obviously we're, we're manipulating that. But again, the cluster weight was 244, ranging from 330 to 157. That is definitely Primitivo. Um, and I'll sh we'll show you that down here somewhere. Uh, berries per cluster varied from 176 to 98, and berry weight 2.4 to 1.4. So a lot of difference, at least in this first look. Um, but when you look now and compare the primitivos, that's where you see these really popping out. So the primitivos, the yield is, is pretty good. They yield slightly less, but the yield is not substantially less. They always seem to have more clusters per shoot than the average here. They always have fewer berries. There's that 157 is the 157. Um, and the lowest numbers of berries per cluster, 98. 
uh, relative to this uh, average of 136. They're always somewhat below that. Um, and the berries uh, can be on the small side. Here's the, the smallest one is 1.4 is, is equivalent to the smallest one there. So, uh, by the way, one th data, piece of data that I, that I did not bring to show you is that we have measured cluster rachis length in Primitivo, and it's one centimeter longer. Okay, I'm not make a big deal out of one centimeter, but you add <clears throat> the slightly longer uh, cluster rachis length to the fewer berries and the smaller berries, and you get a looser cluster. And we've done some cluster. Uh, there's a technique that was developed in Jim Marois' lab uh, here on campus many years ago. Uh, Mike Vailed actually did the work. We've taken cluster um, compactness measurements, and it's a, essentially an apple pressure tester, not with the blunt apple pressure uh, piece on it, which measures how soft apples are in storage, but they put a little wedge uh, on it. And we go to a place where two berries are right next to each other, and you apply this pressure tester, and it measures in force how much pressure it takes to push those two berries apart. That is essentially a test of cluster compactness. The more the compact the cluster is, and they've shown this by, by other independent methods, the more compact the cluster is, the more pressure it takes to separate those two berries. And indeed, Primitivo is, uh, is less compact by that measure uh, than, uh, than, than Zinfandel. Um, and, and in the, well, I'll mention this as a brief uh, example. In the, in the trial that we, um, we did uh, uh, in, in one particular case, there was a high pressure of, of bunch rot, and this was a plot was being taken to red wine and, uh, in summer bunch rot. And they actually rotted so much that the clusters were beginning to drip onto the, onto the soil down below. I mean, it was a very bad year. Um, Certainly not a, not a management issue, but it was just a really bad a bad year for that, and the clusters were very compact. Um, and you'd go to you came to Primitivo, and there'd be nothing. I mean, it was just so 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 visually evident that Primitivo was not rotting as much. And 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 so my my recommendation to anybody who's growing Primitivo, I'm go, I'm sorry, trying to grow Zinfandel in a high rot area, I would certainly uh, consider Primitivo as the as the one to use. Um, Let's go back now and, and finally look at the foundation 1A, 2, uh, and 3. Uh, and I'm sorry, Deborah, I did not get the uh, M out of there uh, in this slide, but now foundation plant services. Um, but if you look at the average of all of the Zins at 4.8, we're right in that neighborhood. So in this vineyard, the foundation certified materials are not performing badly. And it'll be interesting to see if anybody else has any data that, that suggests otherwise compared to what they're, they're measuring against. Um, the clusters per vine were 19 and 20 against an average of 21. The cluster weights, 244 against one that's higher and a couple that are lower. Uh, berries per cluster, 136 was the mean of the overall block, were again one higher and, and two lower than that. And berry weights spot on to the average. So this notion that UCD materials were, were somehow um, uh, inferior for the way they were selected. Now, I'm, I'm strongly in the belief that that's where they were planted and, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, in this particular block. And, you know, we have excellent uh, vineyard management uh, with our colleague Jason Benz and Mike Anderson involved here and, and uh, Doug White Vineyard Management doing the farming. You know, we're, uh, I, I think they're, they're doing a very nice job. So. Uh, these vines are not being uh, overcropped. Uh, I think they're pretty much in balance. Um, and therefore, we do not see at least anything to, to support the idea that the UC materials were, um, were badly inferior by at least these measures. So our conclusions from this are that the Zinfandel selections show variability in yield components, cluster weight, berry weight, and they contribute to, uh, I should say, berries per cluster and, and, and berry weight. That contributes to cluster weight. That contributes to yield. The foundation uh, services uh, selections do not appear to be distinctly different from the other field selections. Uh, they're kind of middle of the road. Um, and the greatest differences are between the Zinfandel selections and the Primitivos. Uh, and uh, that's, that's just something that we've seen uh, more than once and has been reported in the literature and other, other places. But one of the more exciting things about this, we tried to make wine, well, we did, I mean, we, we did, but we struggled to make wine out of that small vineyard. Uh, that is, the, 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 uh, the plots were small. As I said, there were seven vines. We were lucky to get about 100 pounds of fruit out of there. And, of course, we're doing it with current Zinfandel uh, numbers in mind, which means relatively high bricks um, and, uh, and relatively high pH, which, which is where they end up. And then small lot winemaking is, is really tough 
under those conditions, and we and we we struggled, admittedly. Um, so at one point, when uh, when Deborah uh, had done this uh, virus work uh, on it, we said, "Well, look, if we know now that some of these are virused, we don't want to continue to take a lot of data on them when they're virused because we don't know if it's the virus talking or the genotype talking." So we said, "Look, we have." Um, we have uh, cases where we have selections out of these multiple selections from vineyards where one of them is, is clean. Um, and we have a number of those kinds of cases. Either we made one selection and, it's, uh, and it was clean by Deborah's test, or we had multiple selections and one of them, at least one of them was clean. And that numbered to 22. And we said, well, why don't we make the cut for that for phase two? Uh, we'd like to make it on based on data, on wine quality, on everything. But we really didn't think that an unreplicated vineyard, number one, with 100-pound with wine lots, number two, that we were going to get real far with that. We said, let's make the cut uh, on the number that are just clean right now, and let's go take a look at them in greater depth. So that's what we've done. So we now have 22 selections from all over again. It's in Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino. Uh, it's Foothills. It's Lodi. It's uh, San Luis Obispo. It's uh, Central Coast. Is, I mean, sorry, uh, East Bay is, is represented. Um, they're head trained and spur pruned like the old block was. We still didn't win that uh, argument with our friends at Zap, uh, but we're happy. Again, happy. I shouldn't. I'm just kidding about that. But we, we, they are head trained and spur pruned. We closed them in a little bit more, six feet by eight, uh, vine by row, um, and we were able to pack a few more vines into this. It's a 2.4 acre vineyard, again on St. George for the same reason. This time now, five replicates of 18 vines per rep. That gives us 90 vines. We can now. Uh, do a roughly a white bin fermentation um, uh, with, uh, with these. Um, working again with uh, Zap, um, we, uh, uh, our, our winery here is not able to handle 22 white bin fermentations. Uh, so we worked with uh, Zap to select a winemaker for this. They, they, uh, they put out a call and really only had one applicant for that position or for that, that role. That was uh, Ravenswood and Joel Peterson is making these wines now. Um, and so for me, the, 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 the key for this uh, is going to be the wines, uh, because you've been to these kinds of tastes before. The reason you have glasses in front of you is because you can take all the berry weight data and, you know, anthocyanin data that you want, and in the end, you're all going to say, but what does the wine taste like? So we have to get there as well. 22 is a lot. I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we'll present all 22 to people because it might be somewhat overwhelming. Um, but, but again, they've done a very nice job uh, with the winemaking. We did a kind of a trial run uh, uh, in 05, and then a bigger, not quite all 22 were ready. We did 22. I think, Mike, we did 22 last year. All, yeah, and, and, and hats off to Mike, Mike Anderson. Have you ever tried to pick 22 different plots on the same uh, day, or we did, I think we did half one day and roughly in half another day. Um, I want to again uh, acknowledge and thank uh, the Zinfidel advocates and producers for funding this this, this trial. Um, Zap has been uh, with us right down the pike with this, and I don't know if there are there any, any advocates here of, of Zap. Yeah, there's a few. Oh wow, great! And and we sell with this label. We we they have sold uh, uh, these Zinfandel wines. Um, at the Fort Mason, well, not the Fort Mason event on Saturday, but the uh, dinner with the winemakers the previous evening, and auction off uh, uh, magnums of this wine. And so it's been a, a great, a great uh, interaction, great partnership uh, with Zap, and, and we take our hats off to them for everything they've done, the producers uh, as well as the advocates. So again, support for the project, uh, mostly Zinfandel advocates and producers who send their money to AVF, and AVF funds us, American Vineyard Foundation. We did receive early on um, uh, the IAB, as Deborah mentioned, the Fruit Tree, Nut Tree, Grapevine Improvement Advisory Board uh, was, was involved in uh, doing some initial testing for us, which we're grateful for. And uh, of course, a big uh, additional bullet down here that I, that I forgot to mention, but I did a couple times uh, to you, was to thank Foundation Plant Services, because they've done uh, yeoman's uh, work with us. and. Uh, the, the next step for this, um, uh, with this 22, is to is to get those materials as quickly as we can into Deborah Galino's hands, so that they're waiting. The the worst thing that we could possibly do, I think, I mean, the the most d uh, discouraging thing, could be that we identify a selection and then we say to people, hang on, you know, we're going to put it through foundation and we'll see you three or four years from now. 
Um, so we're trying to kind of front load the process by, by getting some things into foundation, essentially stuffing a few aces up our sleeves so we can pull them out later and, uh, and, and be ready to go uh, when we find something that we think is going to be uh, uh, really valuable. Um, so again, I've uh, got a few minutes for questions. Um, anybody have any uh, questions on this project? We'll start right here in the front. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the primitive on this, this experiment seemed to be different from the other uh, discussions of uh, Zinfandel, but it wasn't clear to me. How do you know that primitivo is, is representative of primitivo? You didn't get 63. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, I, I said uh, that we, you know, that Zinfandel is different from Primitivo, but, but you're exactly right. We don't know that we have Primitivo that represents Primitivo everywhere. Um, one of the things that, that did uh, that did generate that those other two selections, as Deborah said, when Antonio Calo came here, and I happened to be just coincidentally, fortunately, in the vineyard with him on the day that he made this comment, that he said, you know, your, Zinfin your Primitivo doesn't taste um, as concentrated as I would have expected here. Now, maybe it's Davis, who knows? I mean, I, who, who knows what the reason for that is? He said, but I'll send you a couple because I think they're, you know, they're a pretty nice selection. So that's not, that's not what you would call an authoritative, well, Kello is pretty authoritative, I don't mean to say that, but I mean that, that I don't know to the extent to which those materials represent uh, Primitivos everywhere. It'll be really interesting to see whether the Primitivos match up with the Solyanic uh, Kostolansky or not. I mean, I think that's going to be one of the more interesting questions. Yes, sir. Simple question. If you discover this great set, does it belong to the farmer who had that float in the first place, or is it all UC Davis? Yes, yeah, the question's about the rights issue. Um, there are people who said when, when we were on their property, um, I'll give you this for research, but, but I don't want you saying that this is this selection. Um, that not, not to attribute it to them because they felt their story had value and that people would be willing to buy their budwood to, to capture that same value. So we're not going to use their names associated with this. The, 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 uh, and I'm going to leave it up to somebody else to comment, but, but my understanding right now is that clones can't be patented um, because they're, not, they're, they're naturally occurring. But, so if that stays with that and no one challenges me from the speaker's table, uh, that uh, you know, people could trademark their materials, which is what the French have done, um, and uh, that trademark obviously would be theirs to hold. Um, so we, we've, we've avoided any contentious issues thus far. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that, that uh, people were really willing to work with us to essentially, and, and I, I, think, I, don't, I don't think this is an overstatement to say that, you know, the old adage about the high tide raises all the boats, that if we get better materials and foundation plant services, everybody's going to be making hopefully better wine wherever they grow it. That's, that's the eventual goal. So a question down here, and then uh, there's more, I'm sorry. In the original selection of the six clones, um, were there any considerations for the type of wines like white zen? Some of them look like they're very good in white zen or red. They might not be zen. Was that a distinction made between the original selection? Right. The question was for the original selections, was there any consideration paid to white versus red? Is that, well, based on what we had heard, and, and I think our experience in industry, we felt we had the white base pretty much covered. Uh, and that was, the, that was the original concern, was that they make pretty good white, and they yield a lot. You know, you can get, I've heard people getting 14, uh, 16 tons uh, when you load them up, and you get them on a good rootstock with good management. Uh, clearly, that's for a white program. Um, uh, so it really was not our focus at that point to, to and, and the white, you know, financial dynamics, uh, economic dynamics were completely different. It was the people with the low-yielding uh, red Zin vineyards were the ones that we were worried about losing. Uh, so there, that's where we placed all of our effort was 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 for red because we just felt that we had sufficiently su sufficient coverage on whites. That was our that was our goal. Yes, sir. As part of this project, uh, will you or, or, or did you ever get into interesting discussion of what represents old vine Zinfandel, uh, what, uh, or, or what is old vine Zinfandel, and what, uh, how can it be defined? The question is, did we ever get into the discussion about old vine Zinfandel, and how can it be defined? And I, I, I run, don't walk away from that question. Um, 
the, it's, it's, it's a marketing issue right now. As long as TTB is not going to get involved in what's old clone, mother clone, old vine. Um, I mean, we, we just made our selections, I said, based on, on visual evidence uh, to, to, to the eye that they just look like they were leaf rolled if they weren't, if they weren't at least 60. Um, but, you know, I've, I've, you, know you, you, you can talk to people who have uh, selections that are, you know, first couple of crops are doing very well. I mean, it's just, I really think it's, you know, that Zinfandel may be very um, expressive. That's, that's what we were initially concerned about, by the way, was that even if you, even if you have a, a, a Parker or a Spectator or somebody's giving their opinion about these Zinfandels and how different they are, it could all be where they're being grown. I mean, the different soils, the different managements. So that's why we said to ourselves, we don't know if they're really different or not. So, but, but whether that's an, you know, old vines, because people want me to comment all the time on why old vines are better than young vines. And I, I don't really, I mean, I know that they kind of, people talk about them settling down as they reach, uh, you know, 15, 12, 15 years and on. And that you see that picture of that old Zinfandel vineyard that was there. I mean, those things seem like they do, do well year in and year out. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is about them. We've never really analyzed uh, you know, root distributions or, you know, did a lot of work on physiology and uh, that may be another phase that we could get into. We really talked about at one point going back to the original vineyard where we could hopefully we have maps or we could find our tags or something and see if we could measure something in that vineyard and relate it back to the vine that we have and see, are they matching up? Is it performing differently at Oakville than it is in, in the original vineyard? We just didn't have the resources to do that right now. But uh, we'll, it's, it raises, you know, it's like typical for research. You raise as many questions as you answer, which is why we have a job. Uh, another, was there more? Yes, sir. Boy, we're just into one minefield right after another, aren't we? Zinfandel on the wire versus Zinfandel head trained and spur pruned. Um, can we talk about Cabernet uh, cane pruned versus cordon pruned? Um, the, I'm sorry? Not an opinion. Are there any studies? Oh, no. I don't know of any studies. Paul Vertigal, would you know of any studies comparing uh, tra train on a wire versus uh, head trained? Data, but it's not published. You have data? Do you want to publish it, or are you afraid you're going to get telephone calls? Yeah. Yeah, there's differences, and there's some wineries that they really focus on head train is the only way, and traditionally say head train is the only way. It's not the only way to grow grapes. But in general, if you can grow good grapes, it can be done on grow. I mean, so so Paul's saying that there are some differences. It can be done both ways. Obviously, we know it can be done both ways, but the, there are some differences. But one one thing you could I mean, you could start, you know, if you want to talk about people opining like Charles was talking about for why, where the name Zinfandel came from. We could do this all day for why is it, wires different from, from head train. One would be that sh uh, shoot orientation. If you're talking about a trellis system which is vertically shoot positioned, uh, that shoots growing up tend to grow faster than shoots growing down. Uh, that, that growth rate might lead you to uh, some differences in, in, in cluster uh, you know, development. Um, you know, you could start talking about the exposure, which would be different if their shoots are arching, as you do in these gublet styles, and then the clusters are hanging down, generally a little more dappled light from the, from the leaves, uh, rather than uh, that sort of direct uh, kind of harsh light that you get sometimes on, depending on where you are and how much cover you leave on the, on the sun side of a vertical position. So, you know, there's a lot of differences, and I think that, that what we're concerned with right now, rather than trying to distinguish those, is really to say, are we going to see different clones popping out differently when we put them on wire? So that's, that's obviously the, big, the biggest question, is if, if you're the other person, if we did them on wire, you'd be wondering about head train. If we did them on head train, you're wondering about wire. Will that work for me? We're hoping that we can, you know, by at least getting uh, some, some materials that perform well in terms of, uh, you know, depth of character, uh, tannin levels, uh, uh, anthocyanin levels, uh, that they will hopefully car carry those characteristics over, but we'll have to check for sure. I saw another, uh, um, so I hope I, hopefully I got to the to your question or, or, si or sidestepped your question. Go ahead, uh, David. I guess that there are probably not that many varieties where you have old vine. You know, like you wouldn't find really an old vine Bordeaux vineyard. You know, because the productivity, and at least my my knowledge of it, is that the productivity of those varieties isn't economic at 40 or 50 years. And you're out. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. And I, I should have made that point while talking about the Italians saying you can do this with Zinfandel. This is probably the only thing you can do it with. I don't know. Thompson's, okay? You probably find some old Thompson vineyards in Fresno. Seriously. And we've, and we've done some selection. And on Australian Shiraz, uh, uh, Hill of Grace, or with some of those that are really, really old. The, the, but there aren't very many varieties that, that end up at that point where, uh, you know, they're 75 or 100 years old and you still have a, a grapevine there because you type a, because of other, other canker diseases that Zinfandel seems to be able to uh, tolerate, avoid, whatever, however, maybe it's the way, maybe it's the head training that contributes to that in some way, I don't know. But at any rate, that, that opportunity was there because Zinfandel just has managed this, that longevity. And that, that's why it was such a, uh, I mean, when the, you know, when the light bulb finally goes on, on, on over your head or we finally you know, figured out what, that Dave Gates was onto something when he may, may have been a lone person doing this kind of stuff, or one of the few, that, that there was a real opportunity here for us to capture something which, uh, which you just don't get that opportunity every day. There's no old Chardonnay vineyards that we knew of wasn't even started to be grown seriously until the 70s. Uh, Cabernet just dies of Utypa, Sauvignon Blanc, same way. I mean, so Zinfandel was just a unique opportunity. How are we doing? Any more? Okay, I think you're done. Oh, one more. I just have a question about yields. And, uh, this uh, experiment uh, takes about five tons an acre. Do you uh, take it in second day or tertiary uh, growth? Thank you.